Hubble has been in orbit around Earth for more than 30 years now, and it gave scientists a bit of a scare at the beginning of March when it encountered some problems with its onboard computer. Thankfully, the mission team has since successfully recovered Hubble, and everything is functioning as normal. Hubble's mission is due to continue for many years yet. Scientists expect Hubble to continue on until the late 2030s. So what are some of the incredible discoveries it has made so far? Well, today, I wanted to focus on one of the most beautiful aspects of space. A wide-angled, uninterrupted view of the sky reveals something quite remarkable. There are literally hundreds of nebulae spread out across our view, the birthing place from which all stars come from. But the term nebula covers a lot of different types of interstellar clouds, each with unique and beautiful characteristics. I'm Alex McColgan and you're watching Astrum. And in this episode of the Hubble Images series, we are going to explore a variety of spectacular nebulae that Hubble has examined, and I'll explain to you what it is you're looking at. The first thing to quickly explain before jumping into the Hubble Images is that all nebulae are part of something called the interstellar medium. The interstellar medium is the gas and dust that is unevenly dispersed around our galaxy. This is what the interstellar medium looks like from our viewpoint on Earth. Some parts of it only have one particle per cubic centimeter, as close to a true vacuum as you can get. The densest regions, which are like the nebulae I'm about to show you, can have millions of particles per cubic centimeter, which is still incredibly dispersed if you consider our atmosphere has 10 quintillion particles per cubic centimeter at sea level. However, over the many light years these nebulae stretch across, this mass really adds up. Let's look at our first example, and I'll show you what I mean. Number 61, the Circinus Molecular Cloud. The most basic type of nebula is an inert, cold, and dark nebula, also known as a molecular cloud. They are named like this because they mainly consist of the molecule H2. In this state, they don't do much, and we can only really see them because they block the light behind them. However, molecular clouds are some of the most densely packed nebulae out there, with millions of particles per cubic centimeter. They sit in space for millions of years, prevented from collapsing in on themselves by their own internal pressure. That is, until an external force comes along and bumps the cloud. This force could be from a supernova shock wave, or from density waves in the galaxy. In any case, this nudge overcomes the internal pressure of the cloud, causing it to start collapsing in on itself from its own gravity. And the result is what you see tucked into the center of the Circinus molecular cloud, a star being born. This entire cloud has 250,000 times the mass of our sun, meaning if the whole thing collapses, there's going to be a lot of stars in this spot in several million years. If we zoom in on the star that has already formed, we can see some interesting phenomena. The bright nebula surrounding the star is still part of the Circinus molecular cloud, it has just been lit up from the light of the young star. This region is known as a reflection nebula, a nebula that simply reflects the light shining on it. You can also just about see a protostellar jet shooting away from the star, the leftovers from the gas and dust it absorbed from the molecular cloud. It's a different color because it's really hot, having come from the star itself. Let's move on to number 62, NGC 2014 and NGC 2020. This breathtaking image is a great example of one of the most famous types of nebula, known as an H2 region. H2 regions are basically what happens to a molecular cloud once star formation has really gotten going. The biggest difference between a molecular cloud and an H2 region is that an H2 region produces its own light. The particles within it have been ionized by the solar wind and UV light from the young, hot stars shining within them. H2 regions also tend to be a little less dense than molecular clouds, having only hundreds to thousands of particles per cubic centimeter. In this particular image, you have what appears to be two separate nebulae side by side. 
but actually they are part of the same cloud. It's just that only two parts of the cloud have been carved out and ionized so far. The different colors come from the differences in ionized materials. In the red section, the ionized gas is hydrogen. In the blue section, the ionized gas is oxygen. This difference is due to the way these two regions came to be. In the red section, you'll see hundreds to thousands of stars, each more than 10 times the mass of our sun. It's UV radiation from these stars that is ionizing the hydrogen around them. Stellar winds from the stars can be seen carving out the nebula. Here, the nebula is dense, and so is more resistant to the stellar wind. Here, however, the nebula is less dense, and the stellar wind has carved bubble shapes into it, reminiscent of coral. The blue region, unlike the red region, has been shaped by a single, massive star known as a wolf rayet star. This type of star is the hottest and most luminous star out there, this one being 200,000 times more luminous than our sun. Because it is so hot and luminous, its expected lifespan is very short, only a few million years, and over the course of that time, it is shedding a lot of its mass in the form of powerful stellar wind. It's this wind which has interacted with the oxygen specifically, increasing its temperature to over 11,000 degrees Celsius, which is way hotter than the ionized hydrogen also in the nebula. You can see a small section of the red nebula also has some heated oxygen towards the center, which beautifully looks like water lapping up against the beach and to a lesser extent, there's some blue over here too. Overall, a stunning image from Hubble. Number 63, and a different type of nebula again with NGC 7027, or the Joulebug Nebula. The previous two types of nebula we looked at are closely related, unlike this beautiful type of nebula, which originates from something completely different. While molecular clouds and H2 regions span hundreds to thousands of light years, a planetary nebula like this one is only a couple of light years across at most. And while molecular clouds and H2 regions contain enough mass to produce thousands of stars, planetary nebulae barely contain enough for one. This is because this nebula is the result of an intermediate mass star on its last legs. The star at the center of this nebula is coughing and spluttering its outer shell into space before it contracts into a white dwarf star. Incredibly, because Hubble's mission has been going on for so long, it means we can sometimes see a tiny part of a planetary nebula's evolution. Here's number 64, the Stingray Nebula. This planetary nebula has changed drastically between 1996 and 2016. Just look at how it's dimmed over only 20 years. This is very unusual. Because of the vast timescales involved for us humans, usually we can only see limited movement over such a time frame. For example, number 65, the Cat's Eye Nebula. This planetary nebula has barely shifted at all over a similar timescale. It's not too hard to see why this nebula has the name it does, and it's really quite beautiful, both up close and more zoomed out, where you can see gas and dust that has been previously ejected. Planetary nebulae are somewhat similar to H2 regions in that they are both emission nebulae. They produce their own light through ionization of the gas particles from stellar winds. Let's have a look at another one, number 66, NGC 7293, or the Helix Nebula. What a piece of art this is. The fascinating thing about planetary nebulae is that while some share similar characteristics, no planetary nebula is ever identical, and each produces its own unique fireworks display. And we are lucky to have witnessed these ones, because as planetary nebulae expand, disperse and cool, they will be lost from view only tens of thousands of years after the event, leaving the tiny white dwarf star behind. Which means the ones we can see now happen very recently, astronomically speaking. And because they are so small compared to the other nebula types we've seen so far, they can only be spotted in our local galactic neighborhood. The Helix Nebula is especially close to us, being half the size of a full moon in our sky, 
which allows us to peer inside and see its remarkable details. What I think so incredible about this image is seeing how the stellar wind from just this one star is blasting away at the dust halo which had been ejected away from the star before the planetary nebula formed, just like the halo we saw in the Cat's Eye Nebula. With the Helix Nebula, the expansion of the planetary nebula has now caught up with the halo and is carving it away. This is a mind-blowing image of space, and it's probably one of my personal favourites. There are so many more beautiful examples of planetary nebulae that I could show you, but let's finish this episode on number 67, the Hourglass Nebula. This nebula is pretty far away at 8000 light years, so we can't see it in the same detail as the Helix Nebula. However, its shape, colour and little beady eye in the centre are truly phenomenal. Sometimes, if the planetary nebula originated from a tightly orbiting binary star system, what you'll get is a two-lobed nebula. This could be the case for this one. And you can see the star or stars towards the centre here. No, this isn't the reflection from the camera flash that Paridolia would have you believe. Thanks for watching. All the best and see you next time.